Mark, when did you leave Stockton, California, where you grew up? Let's see, I left when I was 19 years old, and I was, it was 90, it was 90, 1990. And so I was actually, we moved my friend's sister down to San Diego, and we all drove down to like, you know, she was gonna to go to San Diego State. And so she had a summer class that she had to do at a community college. So we got her into her apartment, signed up at San Diego State, and then we went to junior college to sign up for the summer class. And while we were there, my friend and I were in line with her and like hundreds of people in Southern California signing up for classes, a lot of them in bikinis and shorts <laughs> and tan and sunglasses. We're like, God, it's so much nicer down here than in Stockton. So as we got closer and closer, we decided we were just gonna sign up. And so we signed up for classes, went around the corner, found an apartment, put down a deposit, and then we drove back to Stockton. And I came home and told my dad, so moving to, moving to San Diego. He just looked at me like, you're crazy. And I was like, yeah, and, you know, we just got an apartment, I told him the whole story. He's like, yeah, maybe you'll grow up then. And then like walked out of the room. I'm like, what do you mean? I I'm a grown up. You know, at the time I just thought like I knew more than he did, of course, at 19. And um, as I was getting closer to leaving, he reminded me that my car insurance is paid by him, which is no longer going to be paid by him. And that, you know, I have to pay for gas. And then I have to, you know, all the things that I had just taken for granted by, you know, living with him for so long. So, so yeah. And I, want, I moved to San Diego because I wanted to be close to L.A. If I ever got a chance to like act or direct or something, at least I'd be close to L.A. I wasn't actually moving to L.A. because that seemed too scary, but... This was the perfect, safe way to get down here. Sure. And then he left and you turned up the Pearl Jam and yeah, exactly. <laughs> put, it, put on my, what are you talking my about? flannel shirt. Yeah. And just went, yeah. <laughs> so what was your life like at that time? So you're 19, so you're a year out of high school, I'm, I'm assuming? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, well, and you know, so my life was, I was turning one year sober at the time. So I basically had a very rough high school, post high school uh, drug and alcohol addiction and had wrecked, you know, almost eight cars and, you know, pushed my family away. And so that last, that year from 18 to 19 was getting sober, building a life back, um, a relationship with my family again. And so that's why with my dad saying that comment was part of it because I was really like a 15 year old still, like just ment mentally. And um, so I was, I was just ready for a change and wanted to like take some bigger risks in my life because I'd basically just gone to meetings for a year and said I should just go down there and do that. And uh, so, yeah, so when I moved down to San Diego, it was, you know, it was a, a culture shock for one thing and, and also a, a great place for me to, to be going to meetings because there's a lot younger people in San Diego than there was in Stockton. In Stockton, there was mostly you know, these old people like 30 and, uh, you know, and uh, in San Diego, there's much, a, a much younger group of people. So that sort of built a foundation for me to, to really work the program, which I really wasn't working in Stockton, sort of like that young kid. And, um, and yeah, so my life, so moving down was a totally different, you know, what wasn't just like, oh yeah, everything's good. It was like, oh yeah, I'm like just trying to figure out how to be part of society that's not you know causing problems sure and well forgive me if this is too personal but were you afraid that maybe you'd be tempted just because you know southern california is much different from northern california in some parts and there's a lot of opportunity for many things definitely <laughs> i mean i naively thought i wasn't gonna have a problem because i thought i was sober everything was fine but once I got here, it was a different story. Once I got here, then I realized, wow, there's, you know, it's, it's a different world. There's more, it felt like there was more drinking in San Diego. There's more colleges, there was more, you know, beach town, different things like that. Um, when I got down, when I was on my 21st birthday, you know, I was like, I'm not, I should go to a bar. I should be able to like, be able to get ID'd and go to a bar. And, you know, and it was, I went with a friend sort of like, stupidly and you know went to the bar and was like looking around had a coke and i was like what am i doing here like this is not a safe place for me to be um and so we left and you know i'm i'm still sober today it's just, Great. It's just coming up on 31 years this year wow so um so yeah it's you know it, it's it's been 
just life, you know, but, um, yeah, I feel like that. I feel like I was naively thinking, oh, it's going to be fine, but it has challenges. It definitely had this challenge. There was definitely feeling like, oh, wait a second. Maybe I'm just, it was just a phase I was going through, but I didn't have enough experience to know and got, went to enough meetings to know, no, my experience is different than other people that just had a couple beers. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So you felt safe in San Diego because the industry was like two hours away. Yes. But eventually you, you moved closer. Yeah. yeah How yeah. did that happen? So uh, I was sort of uh, telling, I was valet. I had like six jobs. I was like barista, grocery clerk, valet. Um, and uh, I was talking to you know a girl that was out smoking a cigarette like at the, <laughs> at the symphony hall selling tickets. And she was saying she was going to a rap party. I was like, oh, yeah, who's the rapper? She's like, no, no, a rap party for a movie that's being shot here. I was like, oh, cool. I was like, I've always wanted to be in movies and stuff and um, be an actor and director and stuff. She's like, oh, cool. <laughs> you know, I like walked away. And then uh, a couple of days later, uh, she came back. She was out smoking cigarette and, you know, walked up, asked her how, you know, how everything's going. How was the party? And she's like, oh, it was great. She's like, actually, my friend does props. Um, they're looking for somebody if you ever... You know, are you interested? And I was like, it was such a random thing. Like, I didn't say I wanted to work props. I never said I wanted to work in the business. I just said acting and directing. And so I said, yes. So I took this meeting with this assistant and she said, well, um, we're looking for an intern. It's a three week shoot, uh, shoots here in San Diego. Um, if you're interested, here's the script. Um, the prop master wants you to read it three times. First time, just read through it. Second time, read through it and highlight everything that's a prop. And then on the third time, write down anything that you think would be needed by the prop department in a scene. And I was like, okay. And she's like, and can you have it by tomorrow? And so I did. So I read this three times. I made all my notes. I showed up at this hotel and it was like, they had the whole floor, the hotel, the whole production. It was like, you know, production office, art department, props, grip electric. I mean, it was just like chaos on this whole floor, like doors open, people screaming. <laughs> Like someone's throwing a script, quick, quick, get this out to the actor. And then the <laughs> Teamsters are arguing about stuff. And I was like, oh, I love it. I'm home, chaos, like controlled chaos. And so I met the prop master and he um, looked at my notebook and I tried to explain to him like what I did. He said, you know, you, your assistant said it. He's like, uh-huh. So he's like, did you really like read this three times? And I said, yeah, he goes, nobody's ever done it. I've had 50 interns over the last 30 years. Nobody's ever actually read it three times. No one's ever done this. So you got the job if you want it. He's like, technically it's not, a, I mean, it's a job, but you're not, we don't pay you. I'm like, of course. Yeah, yeah, no, I know it's an intern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So called my jobs and told them that I needed those three weeks off and I had no idea I was gonna pay for anything. I didn't know anything. It was just like an opportunity. It was just like, I need to do this. And on the first day there was a strike. The Teamsters were striking. The, they were trying to go union as a big, huge thing. It was like in the early time of like the 90s when all these TV movies were trying to be flipped to go union. And so they had left LA to come to San Diego to do this movie, try to stay away from the Teamsters, but it didn't work. So uh, on day two, they signed, the, they signed the agreement and the assistant had to leave because she wasn't union. And so they brought in somebody else who then left a couple of days later to go do another movie and all of a sudden I'm the guy on set doing everything. And so I went from an intern to uh, assistant props to assistant prop master. And by the end of the movie, the last week, it was just me from the prop department because the prop master left to do a movie. The onset dresser had to do something else. And so I was the only guy left doing every department, including firearms, which I of course was not licensed to do, <laughs> but he just handed it off to, I mean, he gave me the proper training, but you know, they weren't actually loaded, but it was just still, it was still a real handgun sure. that was, I was dealing with on set as this 19 year old. Wow. And yeah. were you eventually then paid because you yes, had, yeah. on the, on day three, I got, I started getting paid oh, and good. so it all worked out and, um, you know, and it was, it was a, the best experience. I mean, I think that, you know, when I, people always ask me like, how, like how, what's the best way to get into the business? You know, how did you get in? And I, for me, either if you want to act or direct or write, especially if you want to write, you know, or, you know, even produce to do as many jobs as you can, because you can be on set and see how things get made. 
And, you know, I was just talking to a friend of mine who uh, just produced this movie and the writer, they kept saying, you know, we have 14 days to shoot this. It has to fit into 14 days. So limited locations. And they still were not able to do limited locations. And then the scenes always had like action and they're trying to do it. And, you know, you keep trying to make it smaller. Once you're on set, you realize, oh, this is why you can't do it more than 14. You know, this is the day you have these locations. If we move, get in a truck, everybody has to go park, park their trucks, unload the truck. You know, everything takes time. Once you're on set, you realize all those little, those little elements. And it helps, I think, every department, you know, up. And, um, but, uh, so when I'm being on set, it was great because I got to see what everybody's job was. And then because I worked my butt off, everybody wanted to help me. So by the end of the movie, I was able to go to everybody and say, hey, I want to move to L.A. So if you have anything as a PA or props or, you know, Teamster or driver or anything, let me know. And so I had all these people that said they were going to help me after the movie, of course, as people go not every single person helps me no but i had enough <laughs> i had enough people willing to take my call and um and help me get some some jobs so within within six months i was packing up my nissan Sentra and you know moving up to to do this movie for six weeks and i haven't i never came back so i may came back to visit but i packed up my stuff and you know moved up to la probably two months after that after the movie so did you move right to Hollywood or did you go to like North Hollywood where it was a little safer? Um, so when I first moved here, I, m I moved into uh, Mar Vista area, uh, like just right outside of Santa Monica because the, after the end of that movie, I had no place to live. And cause I was sick. The irony is, is like I had one friend in LA and she said I could stay at her place. So I came up here, I texted her Well, it was, paged her. I paged yeah, I her, say, you know, huh? yeah, I left a message on her voicemail <laughs> and then paged her. When I got into town, she said they could stay here and then she never returned my call. Mm. So I showed up and I'm like sleeping in my car at the production office on the first day and they go, what are you doing? And I was like, well, my friend, she didn't, you know, so I got to stay at the production co coordinator's house for the, the whole movie. But at the end of it, I needed a place to stay. So the medic on the job was like, oh, I've got this extra room. My friend just moved out so you can, you know, rent my room. So I ended up moving there and was there for about six months and then got my own place in Los Feliz. I was there for probably five years and then moved to Mid Wilshire and been, was there for a long time. And now I'm in the dreaded valley as I thought. And now it's like, I'm in heaven. <laughs> Toluca Lake, I'm in heaven. Oh, well, the Toluca Lake, <laughs> yeah. It's a little it's different valley than place. the valley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Valley, not, yeah. valley adjacent. No, right, right. There you go. For valley real estate, light. Real estate purposes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> At what point did you then go in front of the camera or decide that you want to direct? Like you, So you're working with props, you're working more behind the scenes, and then when do you get to be in front of the camera? So uh, it was 95 and I was working on The Chamber, which is a film with uh, John Grisham novel with uh, James Foley who directed it. Um, it was Gene Hackman and Chris O'Donnell in it. And so we were it was a, it was shot in LA, but then we traveled to Jackson, Mississippi. It was about a guy on death row. And um, I don't know if you I remember, remember it. it was yeah, like there were, it was theater. the worst, least successful of the John Grisham novels. <laughs> and um, films, adaption of the novel. And uh, so we were on, I was on set and the, I was on, I was assistant prop master and then a friend of mine was the onset dresser and we were always, you know, hustling to, you know, do this job. We were doing, you know, working really hard. And the director, you know, sort of saw that we were, you know, young and hungry and, you know, so he wanted to sort of be friends with us because we were like always joking, having fun and stuff. And so, um, he at one point, you know, took the the uh, the walkie talkie and said, it's not cool. You guys all get to talk on the walkies, but I don't. So we gave him one of our walkies and he's sitting there on the walkie changing channels, talking to the assistant director, talking to the key grip. And everybody's like, why is the director on on the on the walkies? You know, he's not supposed to be let leave him to do his thing. But it just became this 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 great relationship. And on set, he just you know asked me one day, he's like, "So what is it you want to do when you grow up?" And I was like, "Well, you know, I like props. You know, I think you know, do a couple more as assistant prop master, and maybe I'll get to be a prop master." And he's like, "Nah." I'm like, "What do you mean, nah?" He's like, "Nah, you're 
you're too good. Like you don't care. Like I can tell you don't care about the job, but like you're good, but you don't, it's not what you want to do. I was like, oh, well, he's like, don't tell me, but he said successful people know what they want to do and they write it out. They set a time when they want to do it by and they put amount of money they're going to have in the bank and then they just do it. And then they tell everybody that's what they're doing. I was like, oh, okay. So next day I show up on set and he asked me, did you write it down? I was like, ah, no. Now I thought about it, but it was such a confront. Like, you know, it was like I, the first day on set, I was like, ooh, watching actors. Like, oh, this is awesome. You know, like I get to see what they do. It's like, oh yeah, I want to be an actor. Then I saw the director giving directions. Oh, directing is cool too. And then it was like, oh, the gaffer lighting, setting up the shot. There's like so many things that I like to do. Um, but it's just like, it's so scary to be an actor, to say, oh, I'm gonna be an actor now. Like, I think I'll just stay as a PA. I'll just stay as a driver. I'll stay as a prop guy. Um, that's just safer. And it was good money. And so it was like, you know, I don't remember like on my second movie, uh, an electrician was, you know, literally at the time I was not smoking, but like I hung out with smokers <laughs> apparently because he was smoking by the truck and he was saying, he's like, yeah, man, you gotta be careful because the money's so good, you don't wanna leave. So whatever it is you're going to do, man, you should do it because you're going to get sucked into this and go paychecks good. And then you do another movie and then it's another movie. And it's like, nah, that's not going to happen to me. So here I am on set and talking to the director. So the next day I wrote out, you know, I want to be an actor, writer, director, producer. Uh, I'm going to start doing it after this next movie because I had a movie lined up right after. I'm going to have $10,000 in the bank and I'm going to do it on December 1st, 1995. So I came in the next day and I said, uh, so I wrote it down. Um, I want to be an actor, writer, director, producer. He's like, okay. He's like, actor, worst job. You, you have no control over anything. Writer, you get no credit. Producer, hardest job and you get no, like nobody cares what you do. It's just, you're responsible for everything. He's like, director, that's the job. He's like, well, hey man, whatever you want to do, but do it because you now wrote it down. And so I did, I literally had that. I had a movie right after I was doing this movie, The Volcano uh, here in LA. And so I, that first day that I started, I knew I was gonna finish on December 1st. And I told everybody, I told the first AD at one point and she ended up getting me a part as this rookie cop and I got to get my SAG card. I told the producers within the, pr while we were prepping. And so when we were shooting, when the producers, Neil Moritz would walk up to me and say, so what do you think? Should we uh, break for lunch or should we just do a walking meal? You know, all those kind of things were just sort of, I would tell people this is what I wanted to do. The director, I'd talk to him and ask him why he picked this shot. I mean, I'm doing my job. It's not like I'm that guy just like hanging out. So <laughs> people were, were open to, to talking about that. And then I finished that and I um, literally took off six months and I started an acting class. I took a directing workshop at AFI. Uh, I started writing and did a, um, a uh, workshop through which used to be film and not film independent it used to be something else but now it's fine and um and then a producing course through afi as well and so i remember i remember uh uh showing up at a film independent event like three months after that you have to have a little tag on your thing and it says you know what your when you sign up like what your profession is so i thought it was like i'm well what am I here for? I'm like actor, writer, director, producer. So I wrote that all down and I met this guy and he's like, oh man, so what have you done? And I was like, uh, oh, I thought this was just like what you wanted to be when you grow up. <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't know. And he and I are still friends to this day. Like we are still, we still talk. We're still on Facebook, you know, connecting with each other. But he was just so like, no, that's not how it works. You gotta be doing something. I'm like, why? I mean, I'm saying I want to do this. So how else will people know if I'm, if they don't know what I want to do. So, I mean, it, it and, and that's a whole nother story for me. It's just sort of like how hard it is to say you want to do more than just one thing. Cause you know, people really want to just go, but yeah, but what do you really want to do? You know, what is it? We have to focus on one thing. Um, and so I just was just listening to this great Ted talk about how you can't be great at one, why you're not gonna be great at one thing. This woman, Elaine, something about multi, uh, 
like a multi-professional, like you have different, different, I, different areas of your life. Like you're a hairstylist and you also, you know, a violinist, you know, somebody that does m- multiple things, which is what I think I am. So, um, I've got way off track on my, on your question, but no, no, um, it's an interesting journey that you, you've taken us on. So with that director, did that set in motion you writing things down that challenge? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, that, that really pushed me into realizing that I had to, you know, have some accountability to what I wanted to do. So I ended up getting a whiteboard and, you know, writing out my goals all the time. It's something I do. I still do to this day. I'll write out. Um, I have a, a friend of mine that's sort of like an accountability partner. We email each other Monday, Wednesday and Friday. We sort of these are our goals for the 90 days. These are the actions I'm taking towards each of these goals. Here's what I'm doing this week. And, you know, it just kind of ups my, my game because it's so easy to get sort of stuck by myself sitting in front of my computer. Like, how am I supposed to get from A to Z? And so, and then it's also great because there's like sort of markers of like, oh, I'm getting there. I'm getting closer to, you know, the end of the year. It's not like, you know, oh, I didn't, what did I do this year? It's like, I did a ton of stuff. I used to, the last couple of years before, I just had a baby four, 14 months ago. So oh, well, I did, my wife did, but um, thank Brian. you. Thank you, yeah, Brian. And uh, so, but it, his, my office is now his bedroom. And so, but on, at the time I had uh, painted a, the one wall in my, in my office, uh, chalkboard black. And I started writing down, you know, at first it was just sort of projects and things, updates, things I was doing. Then I was getting frustrated that my projects weren't going where I wanted them to go. So what I did was I shifted that and I just like, we were going on vacation. I was like, I'm just end of the year. I was like, I just have to clean this whole wall off. I'm just these projects. I'm just so frustrated because I have like 25 projects and like, I can't control any of the stuff that's on this wall. It's just so frustrating. So we went on vacation and I came back and it was like a blank wall. And so I was like, well, what, what can I, you know, I don't want to put anything on there. That's just, just to put it up there, you know, cause I had, was getting ready to have a meeting for something, one of our projects. And I was going to put it up there and I was like, man, eh. instead I put God's will, which sort of like a, I'm the universe, whatever, whatever you want, I'm just going to put it up there. And if it, if I get something, if something happens, a meeting, if something moves forward, then I'll write it up there, but I'm not going to sort of put my intention. This is all the things I want. And so, sort of don't know why I thought of it, don't know why I did that, but what ended up happening was every time I got a meeting, every time I got an opportunity, every time I met somebody, every time I had an audition, I booked something, uh, you know, a project was moving forward, wrote something, whatever those things were finished in outline, I'd write all those things on the board. And so at the end of six months, I was like, oh wow, this is like a lot of stuff is happening. And then by the end of that first year, it was so clear to me that I, you know, I didn't know any of those things were going to happen. So like the day before those things happened, I had no idea. Now I had like intentions of like all the things that I want and what I want for my career and my life, but the specifics of, you know, how I was going to get them, I had no idea. So it was sort of like this weird thing of like, how do I get from A to B? I don't really know how it's going to happen. I know that I want B. And so I take a ton of actions. I do a ton of stuff that's risky. And then we'll see what happens. And out of that, all these things sort of polish over here, shines over here. And so at the end of the year, I was looking I was like, holy cow, like my life is huge. Like I've had this, this has been an amazing year. And it was none of those things were things that I could have come up with. Like if I had said, here are the things I want. I mean, I want to be directing a Capital One commercial. I want to be directing a Nissan Heisman spots with, you know, these amazing NFL football players. Like I couldn't, I couldn't. My aperture of what my possibilities were was like this. But when I just sort of opened it up and went, all right, I don't know what's exactly going to happen, but I want to be directing, I want to be writing, I want to be producing, I want to be acting. These are the things I want to be doing. I want to be with these kind of people, this level of people. And then this thing happened. So I did that for two years and then we had the baby. And so it was just like I had to like clean that up. But it was such a huge thing for me. And I actually miss it. I missed it this year. Um, and I was thinking about it actually this morning go maybe i'm gonna write we have a whiteboard that's behind our now my my wife and i share uh, an office and it's behind one of our sliding doors but we haven't put anything on it we've been like i don't want to let's see what we'll do we'll kind of maybe we'll do something different this year 
And it's, you know, it's just like, oh, he's alive. We have to keep him alive. That's our, like our goal <laughs> yeah. right now is that, you know, and so, but I was thinking, ah, oh, there's so many things happening just from yesterday that I would love to be able like, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. Oh, this is really cool. This is happening. So I wrote them on my notebook. I was like, I might do that, you know, later on today. What if he wants to become a screenwriter or an actor, or producer, director? You know, well, whatever he wants to do. I mean, we basically, we were talking about that too because uh, somebody was talking, one of our families, like, so do you guys have a college fund set up for him? And we're like, wow. yeah, but you know, if he doesn't want to go to college, he doesn't have to go to college. Neither of us went to college, you know, and you know, at the same time of when we we're saying to school, like just, you know, we had a perspective of school, we have one now and it's like, you know, we want, him to have as much opportunity as possible and as much knowledge as possible. We don't want us to force him. We already tried to force him to like eat when we want him to eat, to do what we want him to do. That's not working. So I don't think it's going to be successful when he's in, you know, graduating from high school. So we just really want to try to, um, if he wants to be a screenwriter, if he wants to act, if he wants to, you know, if he's, you know, wants to be a hairstylist, he seems to want to help her do her makeup. So maybe he'll nice. be a makeup artist, you know, so yeah, whatever he wants. So. Well, I know we were talking earlier and, and about, you know, uh, safety and, and there's no real safe route, especially post-recession. I think a lot of what maybe our parents' generation thought was mm -hmm. the, the safe, the norm uh, was one thing. And there was always that, you know, my grandparents' generation get, you know, a job with a pension. And since a lot of that safety is not there anymore, I think it's it's like kind of like just you said, like whoever's will, let's, yeah. let's you know. Yeah, I think so too. I think that it, I think it, it was, well, times have changed so much. It used to be, I mean, just that was how it used to be. It used to be a very simplified way of looking at things. And now, I mean, I had so many friends that parents had lost everything in the, you know, in the market crash. They had all this money in their house. Then they went underwater and they had nothing, you know? And so it was just all their savings was like, oh, well, we have it in equity in our house. And then when that went away, it was like, there's nothing. And so right. there is no safe. There's no, like, I'm just going to start at a bank teller and make it to bank manager. And well, bank is probably the wrong thing. Cause of course they're going to, banks always win. The bank always wins. Banks seem to never get arrested yeah. or anything. So they can, you saw the big show. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the big show. I know exactly what happens. <laughs> nothing happens. They just rename everything. They just rename everything. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> just buy another bank and now they're, you know. Sure. Change laws. And yeah, exactly. Just rename them. You had sent us an email, I guess we're on your email list. And so you don't send out emails too often. I think you do it kind of sparingly. Yeah. And you had an article in one of them that's the title was surround yourself with people who hold you to a higher standard than you hold yourself. And so we're kind of just, that lends itself perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean for you? Um, it means it's easy to be around a whole bunch of people that are miserable and, you know, uh, frustrated with their careers and so they will tend to be in their own stuff and so i i try to do my best to surround myself around people that are trying to better themselves that um, are doing the risky things that i want to be doing so that when i can when i'm feeling down i can call them and say for example i just had uh, a breakfast with a, a writer producer friend of mine who's on a tv show and I had sent him an email and it's so funny. He didn't even remember responding to the email. That was what, like, it's just his life is so busy and kind of things, but he responded. But I had said, so I have this pilot that I wrote. I got a ton of notes from people. I did those notes. I feel really good about it. Then I got notes from this one person and it's sort of a rewrite, like bigger rewrite. But I have in my process, I got this other idea and I'm thinking this other idea is better than this other pilot. So do I do this rewrite on the pilot or should I start working on the new show? And so he wrote back, oh man, how many times I've been in this position, finish rewriting the pilot, then go to the new story. And so it was that kind of thing. And then he had sent an email a couple of weeks later, hey, checking in, did you start working on the pilot? And he totally forgot, he checked in, he forgot that he had, resp I mean, he remembered after I told him, but it wasn't something like he was walking in. But um, so for me, trying to surround myself with people that hold themselves to a higher you know calling and higher you know sort of responsibility that helped me and so and that's how i am with my friends i'm you know i studied with milton katselis at the beverly hills playhouse and one of the things he used to say when people were late to class he would say man 
you got horrible friends in this class to the person that walked in and usually usually the person like well, what do you mean it's like well if i'm your friend i would have like walked out you know before you got here and called you and said where are you why are you here your friends aren't holding you accountable they're not helping you and so that was always something that like you know that i want to try to be he said it's more difficult to do that with friends and you can potentially lose a friend because you're you say, are you willing to lose a friend to help them and to help them be better? And I think that's what, you know, I try to be, I'm not perfect with it. There I'm sure there's friends of mine that I should, I could push more or support more. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, I'm not doing everything I should be doing. You know, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm saying that mm-hmm. how I can support and uplift some people around me. Um, you know, it's, I think it's important. I think, it, I think it's just, I think it's, my default is not to take action. My default is really to, you know, find what's wrong with what I'm doing and sort of just stay in this like hamster wheel of like, it's not working. I don't know what to do. How do I figure it out? And that's why what that wall, like before I had all this project. So I sit there and go, trying to figure out how he was going to get the right person to read this script or, you know, take this meeting instead of just going, okay, I have this project. Now, what are the actions I can take? Okay. Here's the emails of these five people done. Do these things. Great. All right. So I did that. And then what else can I do today? Oh, I guess I'll go to the beach or I'll go have lunch or, you know, my wife and I will go do something. Or now it's like, oh, right. I have my hour and a half to do something. And then he's up and it's like, okay, you got him. No. Okay, great. I'll th- I got him kind of thing. <laughs> Well, let me just play the devil's advocate here because um, I think it's great that you have that desire to want to be around people that are going to hold you to a higher standard or maybe they're further along. But then there's this thing in LA where sometimes when people do achieve things, it's almost like a magnet and then people go away and they get kind of like left to their own devices because maybe they're not at the same level and they feel bad about themselves Mm -hmm. and threatened. So I find that interesting that you want to surround yourself with either people that are going to hold you accountable or maybe people that have maybe a few more credits or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you feel like that's beneficial because I don't know if everybody thinks that way. And Mm -hmm. I hate to take a negative turn with it, but I think that's a very big thing in this town. Oh yeah. I mean, I feel like there's a, there's a lot of people that, you know, don't want people to be successful. That means they feel very, um, limited. I, I, that's my limit. I feel like it's limited to think that if you get something, that means that I that there's nothing left for me if you get that thing because there's just so many there's so, so many opportunities. There's enough work for everybody. There's enough for everybody. And so I think it's hard for people because you're fighting for you know even asking for help from somebody. I mean, it's hard to ask for somebody to go. Oh, hey, can you introduce me to so and so that you know? if I'm trying to get a project with that person, that that happens a lot. And so sometimes it's like, oh yeah, that's an easy thing. And other times it's like, oh, I know you have a project that's very similar to mine. So I, in those situations, I would usually be honest and say, if it's something like that, I'll say, listen, I would love to, but right now I have this project that I'm trying to get to them. As soon as that's dead, I'm more than happy to sort of get that, but I can't with all the other people that are involved in this project that don't feel right to just do that. And then other times it's like oh, the director that I know is trying to like get into this with this producer. I've already gone everywhere I can with this producer, you know, to network with them. If I can get this woman a job, why does it hurt me if she can get a job? So I do the introduction and, you know, it doesn't hurt me. And I find that the more I'm willing to um, help people, it always comes back. There's just, it just, at whatever level, you know, um, I think that's the, I, I think it's, it's hard for me to understand when people ask for help and you can see that it's just so selfish and so self-centered that there's no, there's no give anywhere. There's no, like, let me, you know, if you needed something, I would help you and be more like, you know, help me with this thing. Cause I heard, you know, the thing compared to, well, yeah, I don't, you don't have anything to offer me, but I could still, you know, it's like, where's an exchange of or at least um, a thank you, a, a real thank you instead of, you know, a whatever. Okay, cool. Thanks. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's knowing, it's knowing when someone's more of a taker and, and yeah. all that. And I get that, but I, I guess just, I, I find that refreshing that you want to be around people that are going to hold you accountable 
or or that you can kind of aspire to or whatever even yeah. though you've done so much already but i think that's great because that sometimes that's not always the attitude and it's not just that someone thinks that you've, you've taken a job for me it's just they haven't gotten the job they wanted right and so it's too painful to be around someone that they perceive everything's going their way yeah absolutely and and i think that there's two things i ha i do have a group of friends that have sort of gone away while i've been progressing in my career now my career is still not where i want it to be but just there was there was even a time when i got to do my first direct my first feature there were two people that like just were there in my life but they, i could see they pulled back like there was something about what they sort of their decisions were sort of taking them a different road they were the ones that were way more talented than me i mean both of them still are both of them are better directors better writers like i think they're better but they sort of get in their own way and you know i found myself having to pull away because there was no sort of like the love wasn't you know like i wanted them to be as excited as i was for them when they had things happening and it wasn't i was like oh that's interesting and now you know this is you know about four years later and it's like those guys are not in my life anymore and it's tough. I mean, I tried, I keep trying. Then I was at one point, I was like, I'm the only one texting. <laughs> Tech to, take a look, yeah. what do you got? You know what I mean? And then I'd meet and then it's just like, uh, yeah, you know, and it's just like, oh, where's the, no excitement for what we're doing together, you know? Yeah. So it's tough, it's tough. I mean, it's business, I mean, it's brutal. Yeah, I, that's, I guess, what I was trying to say. It's not just brutal in going on auditions or pitching, whatever, but then the relationships around yeah. it. And that's something that I feel like people don't explore a lot. And you know, I think yeah. it's that's great that you you put that in your you. in your um, email. Can you recall a directing, producing, acting job where not only did it teach you the most, but you saw someone that you said, "I want to emulate myself after this person. I like the way they handled the crew. I like the way they spoke to someone." Or it could be a negative, and of course, we won't. We don't have to mention names right. either way. But you knew in that moment, like this is actually a life lesson. You just didn't maybe know it. Well, maybe you knew it in the moment, maybe you didn't. But it was something that really changed you in terms of the way you wanted to approach something. Mm -hmm. Could have been the director that asked you, that challenged you, mm -hmm. really. Really did challenge yeah. you. Like, what are you doing? You know, you're young, yeah. but time goes um, fast. You know, uh, there's been a lot of that. I think first person that jumps to my mind is when I was starting out and I was as a... Um, is a driver on the set um, on this movie called A Home of Our Own with Kathy Bates. And Tony Bill was the director. And Tony Bill was an actor and while, a long time ago and then started directing. And so uh, what I loved about him was he just, he came on set and like everybody was just this, it was just peaceful. Like he didn't, you know, it was like a lot of chaos with kids. There was like eight kids at times. and. And he was able to just just handle everything with ease, and he was he was really great, and like um, uh, he knew everybody's name, and I thought that was just like you know he saw me at the you know after like week two or something, and said you know I opened he opened the van door, good morning Mark, got in, got in, I was like wow he knows my name, he knows people's names, and so that was always important for me, and so I saw that for myself as something that I wanted to do either as an actor or director or producer. It's like I wanted to know people's name. I wanted to know what they did. I wanted to make sure I said hello. And, um, and then the next one was when I was doing a small part as a bartender in Ocean's Eleven opposite George, uh, Brad Pitt, but George Clooney was there that day. And he has, in the scene, he walks behind Brad Pitt. And that day was, I was walking just from hair and makeup to the set. And George was just coming and he was walking with his assistant and, uh, some grip or something. He's like, hey, Tony, how's your, how's your son doing? Oh, he's like, it. you know, he's like, ah, oh, good, good. All right, good, good. Hey, how you doing? I'm George, you know, introduced himself to me as I was, you know, was walking with the AD. And, um, and it just like, that was something that, and I stayed on set and watched him and Brad, you know, do a scene together afterwards. And I saw him take, uh, you know, a Mountain Dew, a can, and as he's talking to the wardrobe guy, He's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, great, great. Oh, you need me? And they walked away and, he, and the wardrobe guy looked down and he had poured the, the, the whole Mountain Dew on his shoe while he was talking to him. And then he was like this practical joker. 
but he knew everybody's name. He was like talking to everybody. I mean, whether it was the grip electric craft service, me, some guy that was coming in for one day. And I thought that's the kind of, you know, that's what I want to have. I want to be that kind of a, you know, a leader in, on a movie. And so on every month, all my productions, I'm really trying, whether it's just one day. And I do that even when I'm doing art directing on commercials or, you know, a prop master still, I'll do commercials and stuff. And I'll, I know everybody's name. And at the end of the, you know, job, I'm saying goodbye to everybody. And it just, it just helps. It just like, it just makes the, the, the projection better. It makes the day go by easier. And when I'm asking for, you know, uh, an extension cord, you know, I know who the person to ask. I know the right person. I know his name, you know, it's just that little bit. And we're like, Oh, we're a team, not just, Hey, you, can you, and um and that definitely makes a difference when i'm directing i just did this movie in new mexico and uh the crew had all worked together before and so i kind of was the you know it's just the dp and i were the only ones from la everybody else was all local and and for us to come in and just you know even on the prep days to see how they work and how they do stuff you know it was different than the way i was used to but I was able to, you know, adapt and find ways to, you know, get what I needed and give them what they needed for me. And um, and by the, you know, the end of the first week, it was like, oh, this is like just like it is, you know, and I was getting those sort of communications from like the line producer and production manager saying, wow, you really, you know, put us all in our places at times. And yet, you know, we see how hard you're working like that was part of my. Thing. I was like, I'm going to work just as hard, you know, and that was the production designer would had told me out of the first week he goes, um, he came to set and he said, so never had anybody, never had a director be in bed after me, sending me emails and <laughs> up before me responding to emails. Wow. And, um, and that was what that said, well, that's my job. I should be the one first one in last one out. I sh that's, that's what I should do. And so because of that, he was doing, he was willing to work extra hard. People were willing to, because everybody's on the same, same thing. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm just because I'm the director, I'm, you know, some, the, the boss. It was more of like, at least I'm the guy that has to like say yes, no, yes, no, yes, cut. <laughs> you know, I have to be that guy and I have to be responsible for that. So beyond that if you can be the best at your job and you bring your everybody's the best of their jobs and like then i can win so that was something i saw tony and george do is like i felt like they were and a lot of other directors too soderbergh does that i mean soderbergh hardly even gives direction to his actors he's really you know he communicates with them but it's you know he's casting the actor that's going to deliver the thing so it's more about the scene and what they're talking about but he doesn't go hey give me a little bit more he doesn't do any of that stuff it's it's more camera work it's more about let me try something else let's do it whatever you want and same thing respecting crew people and you know so that's sort of what was my sort of inspiration to and i feel like that fits my dna as as a person anyway i'm there to you know that's my dad's like that my dad knows people and knows everybody in town and wants to help people so i think as a director that was something and even when i was acting even on band away it's like being that guy that's like I co-wrote it, I'm producing it, I'm, you know, I'm in it, like it's, I have to be the guy that's leading it. And if I have a crummy attitude, everybody else is going to have a crummy attitude. So I really had to step up. And even when it was not going the way I wanted it to go, I had to be positive. I had to, you know, find solutions rather than where you have problems, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that must have been interesting. So you're like you and the two, you're the LA guys that come yeah. up, you know, and oh, these two LA, and then trying to fit in where they've already established mm -hmm. relationships and all that. And yeah, they had certain way to check off boxes and certain things. This is how we do this thing. It's like, really would love if we could, you know, can we look at a couple more locations because this isn't quite what we had talked about. And, you know, and that's tough for me because I want everybody to like me. So if they, you know, if they say, no, that's it, then I had to still go, okay, but can we have just one more? Is there just like one more location that we can look like? Because this is just, it's not fitting, you know, sort of my references and I'm, it's all about story. So I'm trying to explain, it's like the story. If she just shows up to this place, it's not that scary. And if it's, this place is way too scary. And we're all the audience, why is she walking in there? So there's like this fine line, like, Okay. And then once we found that we found the building and it was like, you know, it wasn't exactly what I wanted, but it was closer than these other two. And I thought, okay, I'll give a little bit so that we can, you know, and so a little give and take. And 
So it was like a nice little thing where they're like, okay, well, we appreciate you giving us, we know this is not exactly it. We'll see what we can do about this car that you want. And so there was always that sort of negotiation, you know. How do you know a protagonist is someone you want to spend time writing a script on, spending years with the film or the web series, becoming that character? If I'm still interested in doing it after any length of time, you know, it, when I'm reading it, if I'm reading a character, you know, that's something, that's one thing. If I'm, if I'm creating the character, if I'm as a writer and I'm, and I'm doing that, um, or just as a writer or just writing for me as an actor, um, if I get frustrated early on in the process and just go like, I don't care. I don't care about this stuff. Like it's very easy in there. And as I'm reading or as I'm working on it, there's a project I was just pilot that I was working on. I just found myself like not getting excited about it. And I was sort of trying to fit. I had heard these people were looking for this sort of project. And so I sort of trying to fit it into what they wanted. And I was like, I don't want to play. I don't want this character. Like why, who cares about this character? There has to be some redeeming quality. There has to be something that's not even redeeming quality. It was redeeming quality. Just like, it was more about, um, I feel like as I'm getting older, like what is it that I really want to, you know, leave behind? You know, if I'm creating something, you know, it's not just, you know, I mean, yes, I want to entertain and, you know, and I'd like to, you know, inspire people. I'd like to make people, you know, have some sort of, you know, go through an experience. But if it's just going to be something and that's just, you know, um, uh, some piece that like nobody cares about or you don't care about the characters afterwards and then why do it, you know? Um, but it is, it is, I find, I find it when I'm, when I'm writing, you know, especially that I'm just, or if I'm trying to read the script and like by page 25, if I'm not into like, well, I'm not interested. Like, I really want to be able to have some, when I have a hook, I want to find some, something, some journey that the, the character is going on, whether it's from, you know, you know, down on out to up or they're good and then fall, you know, but I want to find, I want to see some, something that that makes me go, oh yeah, I can, I can relate to that. I can, you know, I'm interested in that, you know, whether it's the DeLorean or, you know, um, I'm trying to think of this other documentary I saw about the woman who doesn't blink. The uh, Oh yes, with, uh, the Theranos. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was great. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh, you know what I mean? I'm yeah. so interested about why she does what she did, how she, mm -hmm. you know, I really truly think she was trying, she believed that she was going to do good. That's what know? I like to think too, yeah. That it so, just got away from her, yeah. right? Yeah. As it does when somebody just like all of a sudden you're like, oh shoot, how am I supposed to do this? So, since you're an actor, when you start writing a story, are you automatically starting with character, or are you starting with a theme? Um, for the most part, it's character. I mean, for the most part, that's what gets me in. I'm looking for you know um, people. That's what I connect with. Uh, sometimes I think that's what I was saying. There was like. A story that somebody was like interested in and so I was trying to fit some characters into this story and it was like not it was ringing false to me because I didn't I wasn't believing the characters I wasn't believing who these people were so for me um, as the, an act as a you know starting for me as an actor I feel like I'm sort of moving away from acting as being my like main thing that I love doing as much as writing and directing feels like the more creative freedom in doing what I love do, to do, to tell stories. And so, so it really does come from the, from, for me as character. So as I'm, you know, as I'm writing, I'm definitely coming from, okay, who are these characters? What are their relationships? How do they, you know, how do I find some personal connection to them? And, oh yeah, this is like my mom or like, this is like, you know, my dad, this is like my cousin who, are, who's that? Oh, that's like Milton. He reminds me of that. So I'm finding those pieces to um, make it as authentic as possible, you know? So it does, it comes from character. The stories, you know, sometimes the, the overall thing becomes plot. Again, you know, that sometimes is like, I have to do first character work first, and then I can get into, okay, now I can find the problems. Like, okay, that seems to work itself out more when I go, who are the characters? What are their problems? What do they want? Once I get into that, it's like, oh, okay, now I can list 12 different ways to get her in trouble. You know, these are the 12 ways rather than there's the one way that I think in my mind, oh yeah, she gets arrested for shoplifting. Now I'm like trying to make a character get to that rather than, well, 
she could get shoplifting she could you know relapse she could you know you know get arrested for being black at the wrong time i mean all the different things that could happen so it's not just the one one thing that happens um based on a plot thing. So I'm definitely coming from character as much as I can. And just because as an actor, I'm reading something and I'm trying to connect to that. So how am I gonna act it? Like, it's not just, you know, it's not just words on a page. Cause I have friends that like work, write amazing prose, but I don't know how I would act any of that stuff. Cause it just, it's so like <laughs> in the head kind of thing. And this is interesting, but it's not actable and it's not directable. It's so, you know, sort of becomes clever then doesn't feel real and authentic. I'm not talking like clever like the Coen Brothers because the Coen Brothers are clever and genius and real at times, you know, but then other times it's like just like slightly heightened, but we're all there along because there's something about those characters we can connect to. And yeah. you've written two things about con men, is that right? Or just one? Just one. Oh, okay. Maybe it was a, a something you were directing, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, and so when you um, started writing the Bannon Way with your was a co collaborator, yeah. okay, um, did you have the initial idea or did he? So he had originally had uh, a script about a con man that was sort of like the Italian Job, a feature, and so he was working on that. And we were in an acting class together, and he came to me. He's like, "You are perfect. You're just like this character that I'm that I'm creating." And um, he's like, when I'm finished with it, I want you to read it. Like you tell any actor that you're writing a part, like I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna tell you it's great. Like <laughs> that's, that's like, cause I wanna get, I wanna work. And, but he wrote a really great script, but it was too similar to Italian Job. Was, and Italian Job had just came out. It was one of those things like, oh, can't, you just can't do that. Um, but I, but I, I liked the character and there's something about it that we both connected to. And so, that started the process of like, well, maybe we'll do a short film about this character, you know? And and yet, um, when we first started, we sort of were banging our heads like, oh, the short film is not really, we're gonna do a bank robbery. We have to like, it's a lot of money to get like, you know, to you know shoot at a bank that's closed down and you know, all those different things, you have dressing and stuff. And so it just became, oh, maybe we should do a web series. And th once we started thinking of something outside of, um, what he was writing, then we realized we're like, okay, well, who is this character? What is this world? And that really was where we got to take this character and then bring sort of, you know, together like a lot of my story about, you know, dad who's a cop, you know, uh, an uncle who's sort of a thief. Like, I don't have an uncle who's a thief, but I had a lot of, you know, men that were older than me in construction that I worked with that were stealing and selling drugs and that kind of stuff right under their brother who was a cop. And so I had a lot of those things and my struggles with sobriety and those kind of things that had happened. So I was bringing a lot of those personal stories into it. And I think that's, and then Jesse brings his, you know, creative and his, his own story, you know, to the, to the character. And we were able to, you know, sort of shape this character and then, then to build out the world and who these characters were. And, um, I've totally lost track of your question. Oh, that's what okay. You're asking me, but this is just sort of a side question. Yeah. But why do you think we love to watch, especially like lovable con people? You know, like grifters or right. like we're seeing about these different, mostly women that have like posted on social media. It turns out they've had like a, you know, they've been living off of right. someone's credit. But and we're all fascinated by. It's like very scary because we wouldn't right. want it to happen to us. But we're fascinated as a culture by these sort of charming grifters. Yeah, I would love to know exactly why that is too. But I, I think there's something about um, when there is so many, like there's the right and wrong. Like we know what's right and wrong. And so I feel like most people, for the most part, are living in a safe place of right. You know, we know we probably shouldn't steal the stapler from work, so we're not going to steal it. You know, but my daughter really needs a stapler for a class, whatever, it, you know what I mean? And we just don't do it because we just like, we don't do that. You just, it's, it's stealing. Right. But when you see a character then steal the stapler to go bring it to her daughter, you're like, oh, that's interesting. See, I wanted to do something like, you know, I think there's something about we're so, you know, as a society supposed to be doing good. So when somebody does bad, not, I mean, there's enough people doing really bad right now. So we're not talking about that, but in, in, a, in a fun, entertaining way, I think we can, uh, sort of suspend reality and go, oh, that's sort of, you know, an escape into that kind of world. Actually, I was thinking of uh, the movie 60 Seconds with Nick Cage, where they're stealing all the cars. They have like, are 60, yeah, 60 seconds? 
gone in 60 seconds. Oh, okay. That's what it is. And I was thinking like, that's so interesting that they're all car thieves stealing cars, but somehow they, we've justified that it's okay that they're stealing cars. You know, the cops are after them or, but there's something about the excitement of that, even though we would never, well, I don't know, maybe you would steal cars. I don't know, but. Um, if it was a Tesla. Yeah, right? Tesla, yeah, yeah. But exactly. yeah, other than that, probably yeah. not. <laughs> I like Teslas. Yeah, Never Won't be able to afford one, but yeah. So Jesse came to you in acting class, said, I have a part for you that's perfect. And then what was the process like writing the script? Because you were putting in your own sort of flair to it, whether it's personal mm -hmm. or imagined stories. Well, so he brought me the script and then I read it and I said, this is great. This is very similar to the Italian job and this thing. He's like, yeah, I know. I'm thinking about reworking it. And then literally nothing happened. Like six months go by, we sort of do our own thing. That was it. I just read it. I gave him some notes and sort of he was doing his thing. I was doing my thing. And then I'm in class and I'm acting and I'm doing all these scenes that were that Milton had signed me because I was having issues really just like owning myself as an actor, like owning, like I can do this, I can have a career, I was sort of frustrated with, I wasn't really breaking through. And so I was on this journey of two years of breaking through, taking really big risks as an actor. And so at the end of this period, it was like six months at the end after that thing that with the script that I was realizing, oh man, like I'm feeling really good. Like I can't get a job in the real world. <laughs> like it's just not happening. And so Alan Barton, who was teaching that night, had said to, to my scene partner, um, she was frustrated with her career. Her sister is very famous. She felt she was better than her sister as an actor, and yet she couldn't get a job. And he said, you know, you've got to build your own door and walk through it. Forget her thing. Forget her journey. You're on your journey. And so he was talking to her, but I heard it. And I was like, oh, man, I feel like in that moment, I was like, I'm worried so much about getting a casting director to call me in or, you know, write the right agent to like, you know, to submit me that I should just be making my own stuff. Like I'd been directing and making shorts with a whole bunch of people in class and we got into film festivals and, you know, we were, you know, talented. We had enough. I knew how to production. I knew how to do every job. So it was like, why am I wasting my time waiting for a casting director to call me in a director to cast me? me make my own thing. So I went home that night and on my whiteboard, I wrote, today I stopped fighting. And so my wife, Brianne, who was my girlfriend at the time, I said, I just feel like I'm like, got my, you know, pulling the door, I got my foot in the door and I'm like trying to get in, like, you know, somebody casting me. And Milton used to say, you know, get into the party, like however it takes to get into the party. And so I feel like the party's there. I'm pulling on the door, trying to get, got my foot in the door and the back door is completely open. And my friends are there, filmmakers. They're like, Mark, come on in. It's great. Party's great. There's free drinks. There's free everything. I'm like, yeah, I don't drink. No. But I, you know, I was like, no, I really want to get somebody validation. I need the validation from the business before I can go into the party. And so I just let that go. And I, then that morning I wrote down, the next morning I wrote down three, three director, writer directors that wanted to work with me. And Jesse was the first person on the list. And so I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, you know, you had this script and you weren't really sure what you were going to do with it. Would you have meet me for coffee and let's just talk? And then that was sort of like, so I want to do something for myself. I want to create something, you know, maybe there's a version of your script that we can do. Maybe it's a short film, which then started us talking. And then we decided that the short film was going to be expensive. We kind of got a budget from a friend of mine. It was like thirty five thousand dollars or like just for a short film. So that year I went to Sundance with a short film that I had acted in. And there was literally six people in the, in the theater. And there was, the, for the five screenings, maybe 25 people total. I met a ton of people at Sundance, but at the screening, like there was nobody for a short film. Like nobody shows up those late night, you know, midnight, you know, short programs. Um, but I had a friend there that had made the movie himself, a feature himself, and you know, it was like $100,000 and made a deal for international for dvd and home video and was going to make a million dollars like over five years like all this money was going to come in i was like we should do like a feature like do it independent and then we can sell it as a dvd we can raise some money you know like that's the way to go and so as we started to work on that then the web series started web world started happening and i saw these web series and they were making some you know making them like okay looking but they were also making money and i was like well what if we do a web series sort of feature type of thing 
which is funny because Quibi is doing that right now. That's what Katzenberg is doing with Quibi. It's basically short form content that's going to be a feature, huh. which is exactly what Crackle was doing. And so um, we didn't know that. We didn't know what we were doing at the time. We just like, well, it started with we we're doing a feature expensive. Then we thought, well, there's web series, so we could do a web series. Then then we thought, how do we get paid for a web series? And so we, and then we were trying to figure out the writing of a web series. Like, how long is the episodes? Like, is, is it, you know, can it be long? Can it be short? Got, everybody said, it's gotta be short. No, they'll see longer. Five minutes is the longest. All these different things. Like, how do you structure a story in five minutes and three minutes kind of thing? And so it just sort of was like a natural thing. You're like, okay, well, if we did it as a feature, that's, the, you know, we know act one, act two, act three. And then we cut up act one into six parts and then eight parts for act two, six parts for act three. There we've got our series right there. We've got a web series and we've got a feature film that we can sell on DVD and home video if we, you know, make money, if we can, you know, finish it. And that was sort of the process. And so once we sort of figured out sort of our box, we also worked backwards because Jesse was like a video game guy. He loved playing video games. Um, I liked cars. He, uh, he also, we both loved, you know, sort of the con man type of shows. He'd written that. And so it just sort of was a natural thing of like, okay, so this is the world. And then we, we really, we talked about this a lot is that, um, which is, challenging at times but we sort of knew at the time that it was the best thing is we found out what the box was like okay it's going to be a feature it's going to be something that we have to be able to make uh it's going to be for 18 to 35 year old males they like video games they like girls they like fast cars they like you know action sequences okay great so that's our that's our box now we can start to fill in who are these characters that fit that box so we were already thinking, how are we going to sell it? Instead of just going, oh, let's just make some cool project that, you know, because he'd already written a script. He already wrote a feature that is hard to make. So, you know, had like seven minis that were, you know, running around the streets of, you know, <laughs> underneath LA. And so we can't do that. We can't, we can't, it's too expensive. So how do we kind of create this thing? And so that was the process of us um, figuring out what the world was and, and then I mean the, at least the structure and then we got together pretty much every day for six months like in between you know acting auditioning class work photography I was doing I was shooting headshots at the time I was propping and you know getting together every day we'd get together with like okay from four hours at some point we would get together we would write we would talk about story the world read books watch movies watch the tv series that were similar to it and um, and then, but at the end of that six months, we had basically a first season, you know, arc. We knew what the characters were. We had the pilot, and or like the first, we called the pilot the first two episodes. We were splitting them up, so we had basically um, a principle for each. I mean, again, it starts to build. We're like, oh, we can have a principle, which sort of binds these two episodes together. We can have ten episodes. We had twenty episodes. We have ten principles. One episode, he follows them. Second one, he doesn't. And then we get to see how that happens in each of these episodes. And so um, those are all things that we would get together and figure out what pieces work, what pieces don't work. Um, and it was a lot of work. It was really a lot of work. And where did you get the production budget for this? I mean, because it's high quality. This is not like, yeah, I know you said you yeah. looked at other things and you thought, well, this looks more amateurish. That's not how this looks. This looks incredibly professional. Where well, you... yeah, well, we, what we ended up doing was we, we finished it in the six months and then we uh, sort of drank the Kool-Aid thinking, oh, well, people are going to love this thing and like they're going to buy this. We're going to be able to put together, a, you know, a, a business proposition. We put a whole proposal together. We got budgets. We got this whole thing. We started meeting people, some private investors, uh, some big agencies and everybody passed. Everybody was like, oh, it's way too expensive. Like nobody's gonna make a web series for this money. And you know, it's just, I think it was like, I think we had heard that somebody would make an episode for $50,000 an episode kind of thing. So we put that number down. <laughs> and then um, and then once we got sort of six months of like doing that, we we're like, it's not gonna work. Like no one wants to buy this thing. It's just too expensive. They liked the idea, but it was just too high concept for the places that were making um, web series at the time. And so we said, well, 
we were both depressed. Well, usually we were one of us were up and one of us down, but we were both sort of depressed at that time. We were both like, had just hit you know, a wall, you know, where, you know, a guy, an agent at um, uh, ICM had said to us, you know, it's like, no offense, Mark, but you're not Clooney and you're not Soderbergh. So no one's gonna like, just give you guys all this money. So uh, we're both depressed. I'm in Atlanta shooting some photos for a magazine and that just hit me. It's like, why don't we just make it ourselves? Like, let's go at least shoot the first two episodes as like a pilot and then we can show as like a proof of concept and we can cut a trailer and we can, you know, get it to some people. Cause right now they didn't think we could do it for little or money than, you know, instead of it being like a $3 million thing. So we did, we, um, p- uh, put together what that would look like, put a budget for those two episodes. And, you know, and Jesse's wife was very successful and was like, I'll help you guys support. Let's figure out how we're going to make this. So we put down the money together. We figured out how we're going to make it. I think it was like $12,000 we put together for this, you know, three day shoot. Um, And we got a car from Jaguar. Like I reached out to them. I got this car. So we shot this episode, these two episodes, cut it together and cut a trailer together. And then we had started putting a, together a website, which is basically like now would be like a pitch deck for the series, but as a website. So since we thought it was gonna be a web series, it's gonna be on the web, we created a website, we had like the character page, we had like the world, we had you know what the synopsis was, what the, what the season one arc is, how we could brand it, how the brands could come in and you know, you know, uh, be in there from the car to clothes, to sunglasses, to all these different things. And we put the trailer up and we sent this out to like that email list that you were talking about. And at the time, you know, I had maybe, you know, 250 people. He had maybe 250 people. And we sent that out and said, this is what we've been working on. Here's the trailer. We're still working on two episodes. But, you know, if you know anybody that might, you know, be able to help us get this made, let us know. First call I got was like 20 minutes after we sent the email. And it was ICM assistant calling for my friend, Jesse Albert. And so I called Jesse and this is the guy that said, I'm not Clooney and he's not Soderbergh. And he said, this is great. Like, this is great. And he's like, I'm on my way to NBC right now. Can I pitch it to him? I was like, wait, what? Wow. I was like, yeah, said, yes. And then he came back and he said, they loved it. And can I pitch it to Crackle tomorrow? They're looking for basically what you guys have, which is this web series slash feature film. And, and that began our thing. So we basically met all the studios in town and a lot of the networks and Crackle just seemed to, I mean, A, they got us, they figured out, they, they got us as, as creators, they believed in the project and they had no problem that I wasn't Clooney and he wasn't sober. They said, like, you're perfect. We don't want to recast it. No, you're perfect. And other people were like, were you open to having other people, you know, potentially? And um, we said, no, he's directing, I'm in it. That's, that's how it goes. And so between NBC, Universal and Crackle, and we ended up going with Crackle, it just felt like that was like the best home for us. And, uh, and so that's why it looks so great is that we end up, you know, pitch it to them, several meetings. We got like, okay, they're interested, they want to do it. They want a budget. Now we'd already gone through budgets of stuff and we're like, okay. And he said, if you can make it for this money, they'll say yes. So that's what our agent told us. So we knew the number and now basically we try to fit it. We said, okay, we can do for that number. We talked to a friend who put together a budget. She's like, yeah, that's a lot of money for what you guys are doing. I mean, it's not like a lot, but like, yeah, we can do that. So we said, here's the number. And they said, yeah, that's great. That's what we can do. And so six months later of negotiating, it's the same deal, the same thing. And we, um, we got the green light to start writing it because we had basically six episodes written. We had the first season, but we hadn't written the whole thing out. And they were glad they didn't because they wanted to be able to work with us on sort of the, the idea. And, um, and so we worked another five or six months on the scripts with them, getting it to where they said, and they kept saying, just don't worry about budget. Just like, just write the script, write the best movie. And so it was like a, you know, a process of us doing a draft, getting a budget, having been three times more than the budget we said we could make it for, and them saying it's too expensive. So rewrite it. And so we were constantly going back to rewriting it, getting a new budget, rewriting it, getting a new budget. And finally, we got to the point where they were like, there's no more money than what you said you can make it for. So like, let's make it for this. And it was just such, it was a heartbreaking thing because at first they're saying, make whatever you, you know, make it. 
And somebody kept saying in there, well, there's more money. Don't worry about it. There's more money. But there wasn't. It was like, that was the money that we said we could make it for because just he told us to say that. And we didn't know any better. And it's not that he's wrong. I mean, that was the number they were looking for to green light a project. Um, what year was this? Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, this was 2009. Ah, okay. Do you think if it had been 1999 <laughs> and we had web series then, it would have been different? Do you think that the downturn had anything to do with definitely the oh, downturn okay. definitely did yeah yeah it was at that point it was like they were so trying to cut their losses and figure out how to do stuff that everybody was like uh oh, let's not make too much how do we going to recoup our money on this and crackle was just starting out with they'd only done one other show pr previously that was basically a feature they cut up but it wasn't made that way originally but they realized oh that works we can do these short form kind of things um, yeah, but it was a totally different world. I mean, even like I would say five years later, it was even harder for them. I've had friends that had projects at Crackle that were trying to get things made and it became harder to, you know, not even a lot more money to do. It was like, there's a little bit more money than we had for Bannon, but it was like still tough to like get things made because everybody wants to like, can you just make it for less? You make it for less. You like, that's what everybody, I mean, that's what producers and studios want to do because they need a profit but wow. it's challenging as a creative to go you're trying to you know we had created this box that we thought and then they just say, oh don't worry about the box like it can be whatever you want it to be and then we realized oh no that was not we i don't even think we heard them correctly <laughs> you know when they said don't worry about budget i think they meant like write the best movie and we'll trim where we need to trim you know we had parkour people we had like you know 12 parkour guys like climbing buildings they're like no <laughs> we can't do that so then once the series was released what happened what was the reception reception was really great i mean i think that we were surprised by as many um uh accolades and views that we got and it was really at a time where um, the streamies were just starting out. It was like their second season for the streamy awards. And so that was something we wanted to come out in, the, in 2009 so that we could qualify. And so it became sort of a, uh, there was a little bit of uh, controversy in the beginning when we were release, early released episodes because we wanted to qualify just like they do with the Academy Awards. People release the movie in December so they can be, you know, qualified for the awards. And because our web series was, produced by Sony and by Crackle became sort of like, yeah, but the web series is different. Web series are independent. And so it was within the community, it was a bit of a challenge because people were thinking, well, it's, an, it's a network, it's a studio. And we're like, yeah, but we're just filmmakers. And like, they gave us a little bit more money than if we'd done it ourselves, but like, well, there's nobody behind us besides, you know, they're helping us, but we're just two guys making a film. We, that's all we are. And um, but it was well received. It had for that time it had, you know, 14 million views, the most views anybody had ever had at that point wow. for for a show. Now that's like nobody like 14 million. That's nothing. 140 million is not even nothing anymore. And um, but uh, and then we we were nominated for wars and stuff with Banff and with wow. streamies. And so, yeah, we were really um, surprised uh, and excited that people were, were digging it. And we got to, you know, we were at Comic-Con signing posters and it was crazy. It was, it was such a great time. And, and then once sort of some of that died down, did you think that that would have helped to lead to another project? Oh, yeah. I drank the Kool-Aid on that too, thinking, oh yeah, this is going to be just natural. And I just walk in the door, tell them I did this and be able to lead to something else. It what it did is it opened a lot of doors for me and I was able to be able to you know to take meetings and get things across and almost get certain things made i did book a ton of jobs out of afterwards that you know that i got specifically because i had done it um but it wasn't as easy as like I thought, oh yeah we'll just be able to make this as a tv series and we had pitched it to it as a tv series with sony television and didn't wasn't able to get it made and we're like okay we'll, we'll go do something else and we both sort of split off and did our own things and try to get things made and you know i think that the the business is seductive where you start to think oh yeah this is easy like we just made this and i think i said in one of my my blog posts too it's like it's easy to get sucked into knowing what how hard something is. So as I'm creating something, I'm thinking, oh, 
I know what they want. They're not going to want this because they want X, Y, and Z. So then I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to do something else. And so I found myself right afterwards trying to give them what they want, what different places wanted and not doing something I wanted. And so that's where we sort of where we started with saying, now I feel like I want to create, you know, projects that I'm excited about, things that mean something to me because those things will get made eventually or not. But I'm at least spending time doing that rather than going, oh, so um, uh, ABC is looking for this kind of show. OK, I'll start working on something like that or Cinemax is looking for this. So I'm going to start doing, you know, I can adapt my project for that. And then I just felt like I was just sort of spinning wheels trying to, you know, create something for somebody else um, that I didn't believe in. Does that make sense? It does. What's your advice for a filmmaker between projects, especially one that's proactive mm -hmm. where your your statement is you don't wait for um, bleep yeah. stuff yeah. to happen, yeah. you know, <laughs> keep it PG-13. Yeah. But um, what, what's your what's your advice? I, I, you know, I feel like uh, it's easy to get stuck with thinking, oh, my gosh, this is happening. You know, like right now we have a project that you know, we've been pitching and getting out there and, and you're waiting on phone calls and you're waiting on emails back you're waiting to see if people are interested and it it's so seductive that you know oh wednesday we'll hear on wednesday those wednesdays turn into four months five months six months and you're like i just wasted six months waiting for them to call me to pass you know or having to you know we were run out of options so um, my wife and I have this project that we're that this specific project that we're going working on together and literally we we're like okay so the minute we had something set up with uh, a company and we were had a writer attached and we were like beginning to you know set up okay we're now setting up meetings we're like okay next thing like we have to work on something else together because I'm doing other stuff she's doing other stuff but we want to work on something else okay what else are we going to do let's find something else to do because if nothing else just to take up our time you know, because otherwise you're sitting there waiting. Once it's sort of out of place, it just becomes now we're getting emailing somebody, we're making calls, we're trying to set up meetings, we're setting up pitches. And then that literally takes so long to get a pitch on, you know, a meeting set. Sometimes it's three weeks to get an answer. Then it's four to five weeks to get the meeting. Most of the time they postpone. There's another two to three weeks. Then you pitch. Then there's a week to wait. And then it's, if it's a pass, normally it's a pass. You know, now you've wasted almost three months, not wasted, but three months you've been waiting on something when you could be spending time, you know, working on the next project. So that's my advice is like, you know, there's no, you know, not that you need to have 50 scripts in your in your arsenal, but like you should be constantly working on other stuff so that if nothing else, it just keeps my my mind out of the should I need to check my email. Oh, I need to do this yeah. happen because it's so easy. It's, I, I said it's seductive. It feels that way because it just feels like, like do they? Oh, not done yet. Should I, maybe I should send an email to, to them to see if the executive heard anything. And it's like, no, we're going to hear. We'll hear when we hear. But if I have something I can be working on, then I'm constantly creating because creating is how I got the meeting. Like it wasn't just me, you know, talking about something. I created something that they liked that's going to get me to the next thing. So. So then going back to the, the one wall that had all the projects, but this time at the top of it, kind of like, this is not my will. Yeah. This is the universe's yeah, will, yeah, yeah. whoever's will. And, and, but then here are the projects underneath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely have the, the projects and the next steps for those projects. So those are the actions that I'm taking. And then sort of that helps me to go, okay, so now I understand, you know, here are my projects. Okay, I've done everything I can for those. Like... Probably some more stuff. I get. I probably rewrite that one. Okay, maybe I'll work on rewriting that. Other times it's like, okay, have to start fresh. Like all these ideas are like the same ideas I've been sort of, you know, reworking for so many years, and nothing's really happening with it. Let's let's sort of break free and try something different. Let me just try a totally different genre. Let me try a totally different, you know, character, whatever it is, just to, you know, continuing to be creative. What's been your easiest year? here in Los Angeles as a filmmaker? And then what's been your most challenging? Hmm. Let's see. I feel like the most challenging was probably right after the Bannon way. I feel like I feel like I had um, I had expectations that it was supposed to go a certain way. And 
there are so many meetings, there are so many possibilities that I thought could happen that just didn't happen. And so there was like a year of like nothing really working out and like a whole year went by of just nothing, like no projects that got greenlit, no, pro no acting stuff. It was sort of a weird time. Um, and I think it all, again, that's why I said, like, I feel like there's a, there's a part of me that gets seduced by the idea that I'm entitled now because I've had some success or like that success of this will lead to something else rather than enjoying the process and enjoying like, that's what I did. That's I'm done now. Gloves on, start working again. Um, you know, my wife just finished a, a, a series and you know, it's so easy to get sucked into like, oh, I'm just going to get another job right after this. Or even when you're in the job, like, oh, this is going to lead to something else. And we were in it going, we just be grateful that you're doing this. Let's be grateful I'm doing this because it's not about, you know, the, getting the next thing based on this thing because careers are all over the place. Um, I feel like the easiest year that I had was probably two years ago prior to um, Davis being born where I was just doing tons of action that was just showing up to what was in front of me and not really focusing on, you know, having to get a meeting or get a thing and just like, oh, I'm creating, I'm writing. Oh, OK, I'm doing this today. And it just felt like, oh, yeah, like the flow of just, you know, like I was saying, that wall of stuff that just kept happening. And there was acting stuff, there was directing stuff, there was writing stuff, hired to write, hired to write this script, hired to produce this thing. And it just felt like there was a, like a, um, a balance of being creative all the time. And I could tell you, I can't tell you what I was doing differently, specifically from the year before or the year after, except that there was a, an acceptance of like, okay, this is what, you know, today, this is what I'm doing. You know, I'm not like, I have to be doing this thing. This is what has to be happening. I'm not working hard enough. I was like, okay, I did all those things. Now let's go to the beach. I'm like literally let's go to the beach. Let's drive out there in traffic to get to the beach, <laughs> enjoy it, and then drive back in traffic back home. And it's just like, oh, that was really nice, you know? And then things happen. So um, I think that those are more recent. I'm sure that I've had other years where, you know, they were worse or, or, or easiest, but um, those are sort of examples of me thinking I'm, you know, I know more than, than, uh, I guess it's more of an entitled thing. I think I really feel like, you know, a lot of a lot of people feel like once we've got to a certain thing, you can just, you know, I mean, I have, like I said, I have uh, this group of friends that are writers and showrunners and directors and, you know, they can't get their projects made. They're getting postponed at Cinemax. They're, you know, get, you know, wrote a script almost there with X company on this studio with this network and there's a one of six that don't get picked, you know? And it's like, oh, okay, so it's not just me, you know? Um, and they're still figuring out like, do I get a, a, a staffing job? Do I try to sell another pilot? What do I do? You know, there's no, nobody's ever made it, you know? I mean, there's like the J.J. Abrams and the Spielbergs, but then there's like thousands and hundreds of thousands of the rest of us trying to, you know, figure out you navigate this thing and um, I think it's just you know it's easy to think that it's you know once you get this one little thing you know even just one show I was talking in front of my he had a show and he hasn't worked in four years it's not you know it's not it's not something that's guaranteed you know the success of one thing doesn't guarantee success right after or even you know it could be 10 years um, that's why you have to always be creating and be okay when you don't have something and okay when you have something because you know our life is not going to be i don't think a trajectory of this i think it's constantly you know finding you know finding a peace and uh, uh a, com a place of um inner peace throughout this rocky thing that i'm okay okay this is awesome but i don't have to get you know so excited that i'm gonna you know my life is over if it doesn't happen and then when things are horrible not to think it's gonna be like this the rest of my life it's like nah so it is today. Do you think being a dad has balanced you out in that sense? I think being a dad has definitely put focus on um, less about me and less about sort of this entitlement of all this other stuff. I think it would, the pressure on that I have on myself now is, oh yeah, no, I have an hour and a half to finish something. I need to do it. 
like I've, I've got to write that. I've got to finish this thing. I got to send these emails out because he's going to be up or she's gone. I have a meeting. We both have a meeting. How are we going to be, you know, um, I think there's, that has taken away some of the pressure of uh, the succeeding is less, is, has taken away the, the sort of the, I have to hurry up and succeed. It was sort of in my mind, like hurry up and succeed. So then I can have baby, you know, and we have that now we, now we can have that. And it's like, no, we're not going to ever get to the place where we want to be to have a baby. Let's have a baby now. And now that we have the baby, it's like, oh my gosh, she's the most amazing. Oh, we have a meeting. Okay, cool. Is it 12? Okay, great. But look how amazing you are, you know? And I think that that's been the biggest, the biggest thing. It's like, it's not, none of that stuff feels as precious as it used to be. You know, I mean, you can still feel upset when things don't happen, but the preciousness is like, you know, we're like, oh yeah, there's this. It used to be that with our dogs. Now it's like, now we have him and the dog and, you know. 